My name is David Hay. I'm a cluster engineer with Limbit, a clustering and disaster recovery company. Today we'll be talking about software-defined storage. So as we often start, what is software-defined storage? Software-defined storage is virtualized storage with the service management interface. So there's a couple definitions to think of there. First of all, what is virtualized storage? Virtualized storage is something we've been doing for a while. And that is the ability to abstract away hardware devices like disks into some sort of consumable, dynamic device. We want to be able to do things like not care about the disks we put in the system. When I want more storage, I don't want to say the words, can you put another hard drive in there and give me the hard drive? No, I just want to say, Make a block device of a particular size, please. Done. And that's virtualized storage. The ability to make abstractions, arbitrary ones, block devices, or any other kind of storage. But we're going to focus on block devices. So since we have that virtualized storage, uh, that's all fine and good. We have the ability to have what we can call volume groups, make volumes. But that's all by hand so far. Not so much by hand, we're a little farther removed from hands touching things, but not by that much. So we need some way to control this mechanism. We need some way to control it automatically, rather than having to ask a storage administrator or a systems administrator to go give me the storage I need for my application that I'm trying to deploy. We want to reduce the amount of communication we have to do on a day-to-day -day basis between teams to get things done. So a service management interface allows us to control that virtualized storage through programmatic means. And what is that? That's a software-defined storage system, that control plane and that data plane. So uh, we at Limbit made a few pretty important decisions. First of all, that data plane and that storage plane should be separated. If the, store, if the uh, storage plane goes down, the control plane should be up and it should be aware of it. If the control plane goes down, storage plane should just keep going the way that it's going. You should even be able to replace the control plane if you really need to. You should be able to turn it off and your data should still exist. And that way you can scale them independently. If your storage capacity has to scale differently than your control, then you should be able to do that very easily. There's a lot of different reasons why we want to keep those things separate. So we should have a separate data and control plane. We should be able to interface with that control plane. We should be able to do it in ways that we consider modern and standard. And the way to do that that is modern and standard is the REST API. REST-to-REST -REST communication in cloud systems and data centers is a very easy and elegant way to have a very accessible command set over a very well-known protocol that is easy to interact with with just about any tool, even just a browser. And it's very easy to filter, very easy to understand. We don't have to worry about this CLI interface and that product and making middleware to glue this and that together. No, we just do it through REST. All that is over. We're just doing it with REST. So we have a client that uses the REST interface. We have a controller that uses the REST interface. And what we're using here is LensStore, the LensStore controller. This is what we talk to when we want that service management interface. And this controller talks to what we call satellites. A satellite, we can think of it as a node, uh, but what it really is is an agent running on a node. And that agent controls existing storage mechanisms in Linux. There's a few ways that we can do this, and a few reasons why we did this. First of all, uh, storage mechanisms in Linux are very mature. They're very predictable, and they're not going to eat your data. We know this. They work extremely well. They've had a huge amount of testing, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We should use the things that work well, and these work extremely well. They're already as scalable as we need them to be. They already have very understandable interfaces. So our agents control things like, for example, LVM the logical volume manager in Linux. This is a virtual storage system. This allows us to pool many disks together into a single logical volume group. 
cut them up into arbitrarily sized logical volumes and then present those as block devices, just like you would interact with a disk. But it can be many disks at the same time. And since we're using that, and ZFS is very similar, it has a few extra features, we can use either. Whichever one you're more familiar with is usually the answer to which one you will use. Uh, we also have the ability to control other storage objects in Linux. Uh, we have the ability to control caching mechanisms, such as bcache. We can add optional features as layered block devices. We can say we want volume management, we want caching, we want data replication, we want NVMEOF transport, and we want to put all of that into a stack. Maybe we want encryption somewhere in there. And all of these things are optional. You can choose your own adventure as to what your block stack should look like. And you can do it on a per node basis. You can move from one implementation to another very easily using DRBD. DRBD is how a lot of these connections, in fact, by default, how these connections are terminated. When you make your block stack on a node, it'll usually end in DRBD. And yes, it's replication software, but that's also block transport software. Not only can we use DRBD to replicate data between one node and another, we can also use it to make that same data accessible to a remote node that doesn't even have a disk. So we can use it like an iSCSI target. We have the functionality now. Now we have an SDS that can work over a network, and that is the kind of requirement that we need for something like Kubernetes. That's what we need to make persistent volume claims for pods and expect that storage to be accessible across your cluster. We want to have a storage class that has a set amount of replicas. Maybe we want that storage class to have some of these optional block abstractions that we can use here. We can define that with LinStore. This is what makes LinStore friendly with Kubernetes. DRBD makes LinStore friendly with Kubernetes. And NVMEOF makes LinStore friendly with Kubernetes. So we can make this data available across the cluster. We can give it resi resiliency by replicating it. We can also give that data continuous availability. So if we lose one of the replicas, there's no failover process. We just simply start accessing data from a different node. We also have the ability to migrate data. If we have a replica here and here and a diskless replica here, it's actually quite simple to add local storage to that once diskless node and give it a local replica. And if it has a local replica, then the application that you're using has local access to a disk which will always be less latent than accessing data over a network for machine learning workloads, for databases, for anything that requires very low latency access to data. This can be extremely powerful for making your data less latent to that workload. We want a local copy in a lot of cases. That's idealism in a lot of infrastructure, but with LinStore and DRBD, it becomes a readily available possibility. We also can manage NVMEOF target and initiator connections. And that's a big deal in a lot of cases. For NVMEOF, we need to be able to discover targets. We need to be able to connect targets to initiators, and this isn't necessarily simple. We can't just walk up to a workload in a lot of cases and say, hey, this is what your target is, this is what your initiator is, and expect the two to connect. Not in a system like Kubernetes, not in any scalable system, we can't be putting that thing in by hand. We actually have to have something that orchestrates that connection for us. In a lot of cases, we need discovery mechanisms from things like Fiber Channel and Finiband or Swordfish. But with, uh, with LinStore, we actually don't need that. LinStore already has agents called satellites on these nodes that are totally aware of the storage on those nodes. So we can know where a target is because we set it up. We can know where a target is because we have an agent on there that's aware of it having already been set up. And we can use that information to connect initiators. So we actually have a discovery fabric now. So, and that's available over REST. So you can have your orchestration system talk to that too. You can have Kubernetes very easily get and post to LinStore. You can have OpenStack use LinStore. You can use LinStore by hand with a command line client if you so desire. It's scalable to very large deployments. It's still practical to use in very small deployments and can go from very small things to very large things 
we're able to make decisions on the fly and we can keep making decisions. We can make mistakes and not have to just live with them. We can change the way our storage is designed on the fly. So because we can manage these things, because we can manage NVMe and volumes, all these various disk abstractions, make them available over the network, we have a virtualized storage system that works extremely well. A network attached virtualized storage system. And we have a service management interface that will scale. It will scale independently of your storage and exists independently of your storage. And that is what the LinStore SDS is. That is what makes us friendly with Kubernetes, and that is how you use Linux storage in the modern age. Thank you. And don't forget to like and comment and subscribe. We're always happy to reply. And watch our other videos. I'll see you next time.